if there's something pirates are known for, it is scurvy. Scurvy is a nasty disease that leads to fatigue, soreness, and bleeding from the skin. Most notably, it weakens your gums, causing bleeding and teeth to fall out. Scurvy is definitely something you want to avoid, and if you're wondering what it has to do with this video, the disease is caused by a lack of fruits and veggies. To be more specific, a deficiency in vitamin C. A sailor developing scurvy was said to be growing scorbutic by 17th century physicians. Scorbutic is likewise the word for the symptoms, such as a scorbutic tongue, uh, pick related. Scurvy is said to have been the leading cause behind the majority of sailors' deaths in the age of sail. Indeed, vitamin C rich foods were a rarity in sailors' provisions. Unless you were from the Mediterranean, uh, like I mentioned earlier in the series, their very diet was so good at preventing scurvy that the Spanish called it a Dutch disease. Scurvy was even used as a swear word. During his time at sea, writer Ned Ward described the ship's cook as an able fellow in the last war, and had been so in this too, but for a scurvy bullet at log that shot away one of his limbs, and so cut him out for a sea cook. When Spanish smugglers tried using a fire ship to destroy Captain Swan, Dampier called her scheme a scurvy trick. Of course, scurvy is a bit of a meme. Scottish doctor James Lind is often credited for establishing the connection between scurvy and vitamin C deficiency in 1753, but pirates and sailors were aware of it since much earlier, even if they didn't know the exact science. One sailor wrote that, Oranges, lemons, all sorts of greens and roots, the sailor find much relief at it against the scurvy. However, privateer captain George Shelvock also noted that reckless fruit consumption could be a health hazard. The free use we made of the excellent fruits growing on this island brought a flux amongst us, which weakened us very much and interrupted our work for some days. Yet in the main did us little hurt, or rather than to preserve us from the scurvy. Shelvock did not mention what these excellent fruits were specifically, but other pirates made a very good job at documenting what fruits they ate. Bartholomew Sharp wrote in his journal that the island of Tavoga was abounding in all manners of fruits, such as pineapples, oranges, lemons, avocados, pears, mamasaporas, coconuts. Now, of course, uh, Sharp was referring to the cacao, as in the stuff you make chocolate of, but it kind of sounded as if, he, as if he was talking about the coconut. And I can't talk about the coconut without discussing it from the words of the coconut fanatic himself, William Dampier. I have been the longer on this subject to give the reader a particular account of the use and profit of a vegetable which is possibly, of all others, the most generally serviceable to the conveniences as well as the necessities of human life. Yet this tree that is of such great use, and esteemed so much in the East Indies, is scarce regarded in the West Indies, for want of the knowledge of the benefit which it may produce. And it is partly for the sake of my countrymen in our American plantations that I have spoken so largely of it. For the hot climates there are very proper soil for it, and indeed, it is so hardy, both in the raising it and when grown, that it will thrive as well in dry sandy ground, as in rich land. In short, Dampier believed the coconut to be a wonder fruit, and wanted an American coconut industry. I found 55 mentions of the coconut in Dampier's book. He found them floating in the sea, and he collected them. When he ran out of coconuts, he sent more men ashore to get more. He drank the water and boiled the milk with rice. The kernel was made into oil, and of the shell, he said, the shell of this nut is used in the East Indies for cups, dishes, ladles, spoons, and in the manner for all eating and drinking vessels. Well-shaped nuts are often brought home to Europe and much esteemed. Dampier confirmed that his crew used coconut shells as water flasks. One of these could hold about 1.3 liters of water. Additionally, the husk of a coconut could be used in ship repairs. The fiber was used for weaving ropes and was used in caulking. Caulking is the act of filling in the seams between hull planking to prevent leakage. The plantain was a great favorite, and often eaten as a substitute for bread. I discussed it more in the part about bread. The plantain's smaller and sweeter cousin was likewise enjoyed, though more as a treat than a staple. That's of course, the banana. William Fennell described it as six inches long, very mellow and extraordinarily sweet and good. If I remember correctly, uh, bananas back then were of a different and tastier species that went extinct in the 20th century though banana candy is still based on that flavor. The lime was arguably the most important and popular fruit for pirates. Known as crab lemons or key limes, it was one of the most plentiful fruits in the East and West Indies. Farmers and plantationers across the Caribbean planted the trees close together 
to serve as a fence around their properties. However, just like the orange, the lime isn't actually native to the Caribbean, but was brought in by Iberian colonists. Owing to its tartness, the lime was seldom eaten raw, but used as a frequent ingredient in cooking, as we have encountered previously in this series, and will encounter as well. Dampier describes a kind of sauce which is called pepper sauce, and it's made of cod pepper, commonly called guinea pepper, boiled in water, and then pickled with salt and mixed with lime juice to preserve it. Indeed, lime in its juice was excellent in preventing scurry. It lasted long at sea, but the main reason sailors kept it aboard wasn't for health reasons, but because it was great for alcohol. Rum punch was a mix of rum, sugar and lime juice. Dampier wrote that salt rakers called it Christmas when privateers came carrying these ingredients for them. Though their work was profitable, punch was the only part that made it fun. Lime for punch was in such high demand for pirates that when they established a stronghold on Madagascar, they had merchants import it all the way from the Americas. That's halfway across the world just to get some lime for your rum. Scurvy only became a problem over long voyages when you didn't have access to fruits and vegetables. For example, William Dampier had to return home from Australia when his fading provisions resulted in scurvy amongst the crew. But as soon as the sailors got close to land, they would acquire fresh fruit and veggies to combat the disease. Since pirates primarily operate around tropical islands and coasts, <coughs> the Caribbean, this was not an issue. Fruits could be plundered or purchased from merchants and natives. They could likewise be foraged with ease. Bartholomew Sharp wrote in his journal, having taken our breakfast, which consisted of such fruits as the country afforded. Another great counter to scurvy were vegetables. Sailors called vegetables greens and their consumption of them salading. William Betay, a crewman of George Shelbock, wrote that The Yarl was sent ashore to gather greens. This place affords great quantity of a sort of wild celery, which very much refreshed our men. This quote indicates that veggies were greatly sought after, that they consisted of whatever the sailors could acquire, and that foraging was often done to get them. Wood Sargent wrote that in the first plain we found a store of turnip greens and watercress in the brooks, which mightily refreshed our men and cleansed them from the scurvy. Rogers likewise mentions that his men harvested a cabbage tree, one of the most beloved vegetables in the New World. This was because the leaves of the tree, when boiled, resembled the typical garden cabbage, so often eaten back home in Europe. The trees are very tall, and since the leaves only grow at the top, uh, like a palm tree, the tree often had to be cut down for the delicious green to be collected. A popular pirate's meal was to roast the joint of a wild goat and eat together with half a foot of boiled tree cabbage. I wasn't sure if I should include the avocado in the part about fruits or vegetables, but I figured it fit best in here. The avocado is more savory than a fruit and is usually eaten as a spread or in guacamole. Speaking of which, William Dampier provided us with the world's first English description of guac. This fruit, uh, the avocado, hath no taste of itself, and therefore it is usually mixed with sugar and lime juice, and beaten together in a plate, and this is an excellent dish. The ordinary way is to eat it with a little salt, and roast and plantain, and thus a man that's hungry may make a good meal of it. Dampier also noted that avocado, avogado as he called it, with a G, was used as an aphrodisiac by the Spanish, and much esteemed by them. He encountered the avocado in Campeche, the coast of Cartagena, the coast of Caracas, and even on Jamaica. So if the pirates weren't picky, they had uh, the anecdotal knowledge and plenty of options to combat the scurvy. Most likely, the disease was not as common amongst them as we're led to believe. Big thanks to my generous supporters over on Patreon. Cole Freer, Max Dweck, 1660, Michaela Jans, Red Hate, Wagineer, Rachel, Lockgar, Dyer, Ted11, Flintlock, George Scott, and Part of Jesus. Don't forget to give the video a like and a comment to support the algorithm, and share the video with a friend. Cheers. Bill, I just have one question for you. What is it, Ted? What color is an orange? Ted, you bonehead. Its color is the same as its name, just like a lemon.